All right, so we're home stretch. Uh, this is a very exciting area of interventional imaging with contrast yes, ultrasound, and actually helps us tremendously um, in complicated cases and also in patients who cannot cannot get um, standard imaging for variety of procedures. So honestly, we started conscious enhanced ultrasound in interventional radiology with conscious enhanced assisted um, biopsies because we biopsy more and more lesions. We see lots of patients with small, tiny liver lesions that we cannot identify on non-enhanced B mode ultrasound, and we also uh, see quite a few patients with large necrotic tumors, especially in patients who are involved in extremely wide variety of clinical trials being treated with chemotherapy agents or patients who have been treated with multiple rounds of chemotherapy coming back for retreatment and whatnot. So necrotic tumors are extremely common nowadays. And if you don't have conscious enhanced ultrasound, there's almost no way to get enough viable tissue for you to get to your pathologist. When performing conscious enhanced ultrasound for biopsies, we usually do several injections because one injection is almost never enough for our work. First bolus injection we use to identify the target lesion and to plan procedural approach. For liver tumors, you have to be careful. You need to pay attention to both arterial phase enhancement for HCCs and for delayed washout or for washout phase rather when you biopsy metastatic lesions. The second bolus injection is uh, performed for actual guidance, and you can do it in two ways. You can either do it in a bolus fashion with bolus delivered and then you biopsy quickly while bubbles are circulating, or you can do it with infusion when you drip the contrast diluted in a saline over a longer period of time to biopsy metastatic lesions that will show as areas of washout. Um, timing of needle placement again, depends on the tumor being sampled. If it's something that is very large and necrotic, we usually try to biopsy it in arterial phase because that's where we see those tumors the best. If it's small, tiny lesions, pr presumably or most commonly metastasis that only demonstrate small areas of washout, we do biopsies in the later phases. Using contrast enhanced ultrasound, we drastically improved our diagnostic accuracy. We now have cytologists present with us in the room. We do touch preps of our core biopsies, and if we see inadequate samples in the larger tumors, we go straight to contrast enhanced ultrasound. If we're getting nothing but the normal liver in patients with small lesions, we do bubbles, and then we go in biopsy areas of abnormal contrast enhancement. This is one of the early cases that basically started this conscious enhanced ultrasound practice in interventional oncology for us. Colon cancer, metastatic lesion in the liver, you can see it's extremely nicely with um, diffusion weighted MRI. I scanned this patient myself using three different scanners. For the love of me, I could not see uh, this lesion on, on ultrasound. It was just absolutely invisible. Inject a little bit of microbubbles. There is nice targetoid lesion in the peripheral left hepatic lobe. It was easy biopsy to perform. Another patient with melanoma presented to our hospital after being biopsied four times at three different hospitals, and nobody could get any tissue out of him. Giant tumor in his back, very, very necrotic on um, CT. And an ultrasound, it looked very heterogeneous. I had absolutely no idea where to go with my needles, and this guy already had four biopsies in the last several weeks, all getting absolutely nothing. We injected microbubbles. Majority of this tumor was completely dead. There was not a single microbubble entering this large necrotic tumor. And all the way back, right in front, I uh, mean, inferior to the lower edge of the scapula, there was a small, tiny area of persistent conscious enhancement we stuck a needle on it, and we got malignant melanoma out of this biopsy. Interprocedural guidance with conscious enhanced ultrasound may be proved by utilizing image fusion. And some of the vendors have all those new fancy systems where you can fuse your CT and your ultrasound, producing images that look like this. You can upload your CT or MRI 
performed earlier, same day, or a few days or weeks prior into the system, you find your lesion, you confuse positionally your scanner uh, transducer with CT or MR image, and you can have those small tiny lesions uh, with corresponding CT or MR image together on the screen, and you can biopsy with that or with addition of contrast-enhanced ultrasound in some cases, greatly improving your sensitivity and accuracy of your biopsies. Small tiny lesion in the liver corresponding to abnormal area of enhancement on MRI with contrast-enhanced ultrasound with dual guidance. You can put a needle in there and get cancer tissue out. Contrast-enhanced ultrasound, I think, is a very powerful tool that not only helping you to do biopsies in patients with complicated lesions or with the small tumors or with very large necrotic masses, but it can also stop you from doing biopsy in patients with definitely benign lesion. If you have a young female presenting with an indeterminate liver mass, you can do contrast-enhanced ultrasound and characterize it as definitely benign hemangioma or FNH or adenoma or whatnot, and you can stop biopsy. Because remember that liver biopsies, especially in patients with FNH or hemangiomas, are very tricky because those patients have very vascular tumors. They do bleed. We have to stick large needles in them. And doing this before your biopsies in indeterminate cases can save you lots of grief. Youngish patient, probably 45, 47 years old, had colonoscopy. They saw tumor, they took it out, it was colon cancer, they enrolled him in a clinical trial, he presents with something that looks like this. He had allergy to uh, CT contrast, he was claustrophobic, he couldn't get an MRI, so they sent him straight to biopsy. And you see this very kind of horrible looking hypoechoic lesion with this hyperechoic halo, classic appearance of targetoid colon cancer met in the liver. I put a color Doppler on this thing and it gave me pause because colon cancer mats usually hypovascular. They do not have such a massive amount of blood flow around them. So we said, okay, let's do contrast-enhanced ultrasound, see what it is. A touched dark image, the tumor is of interest is right in there. And if we run it, you can see massive feeding vessel going into this lesion giant area of increased enhancement, large area of perfusion abnormality surrounding this flush-filling hemangioma. Honestly, flush-filling hemangiomas can be tricky to diagnose. What you need to do, you need to go back and go through your cine, slice by slice, and then very early, when hemangiomas just start filling with contrast, you can start seeing those puddles of peripheral interrupted enhancement like normal slow filling hemangiomas would. And then quickly after that, they will fill with contrast and they will remain hyper enhanced throughout their entire the examination. So doing this saved my life, saved patient from massively bleeding after I stick 14 gauge, 16 gauge needle into his liver. So if you have any doubts, do it before you stick needle in patients. Cryoablation monitoring. We do this quite often for clinical patients. It started as a research project, project, but now our interventional radiologists send us all those patients because a large proportion of those patients will have um, poor renal function. They would do cryoablation, taking quarter of the kidney with the ablation zone, further decreasing the renal function. So urologists really want to do conscious enhanced ultrasound instead of CT and MRI for monitoring because remember those patients will enroll in long time, lifelong uh, surveillance. Patient with cryoablation zone in the upper pole of the right kidney, you can see on microbubbles there is not a single microbubble entering this area of ablation, confirming complete tumor response with nothing for us to worry about. Another patient with similar appearing B mode, kidney, hypoechoic ablation cavity. We inject ultrasound contrast. And you can see, similar to the first patient, there is not a single microbubble entering majority of this caps of, of this ablation zone. 
We scan more and more of those patients, and what we see quite often is few microbubbles entering the ablation cavity along the surface, outer portion of the uh, ablation cavity, and we see kind of ruggedy, heterogeneous appearance of the renal parenchyma on the inner surface of the cavity. I think this is all fine. This is just granulation tissue, scar tissue developing within the capsule, which also supposed to have some minimal blood flow. So all of this on the outside is totally fine. We do not call this recurrent tumor anymore. The surrogate heterogeneous appearance of the renal parenchyma on the inner surface of the capsule is probably just benign renal parenchyma growing into the shrinking uh, ablation cavity. We don't call this um, suspicious. We don't call this tumor recurrence. We just follow those patients in all those small areas of decreased uh, conscious enhancement, they eventually go away. The key is they never as bright, those areas are never as bright as renal cortex. They do not enhance in arterial phase. So if you see this late, delayed, fluffy uh, conscious enhancement along the edges of the cavity, leave them alone. Renal cell cancer recurrence will look very different. Identical image on B mode that I showed you before, kidney with this hypoechoic lesion. And if we play the video, you can see this whole area enhances avidly. It is as bright as renal cortex. There is no doubt in my mind that this is recurrent tumor. So our interventional radiologists do not want us to worry about every single bubble entering ablation cavity. They want us to tell them when they need to go and retreat the patient. This is obviously need to go for retreatment, something like this with small microbubbles on the periphery of the lesion definitely do not. So gauge your reports based on clinical uh, need for retreatment. We also monitor patients after microwave ablation and after taste and after RFA in the liver. And this is one of the beautiful cases that we had um, turned uh, lots of interventional radiologists and hepatologists in our favor. Patient with microwave ablation, arterial phase CT, there is a wisp of contrast along the cavity. It was read as probable shunting after tumor ablation. And then there is the cavity with some areas of decreased contrast enhancement that was interpreted as possible post-treatment response, kind of scarring along the surface of the liver. Patient came to see us because the AFP was quite high. The uh, hepatologist was worried that this is not just post-ablation changes. This is rather incomplete ablation with tumor recurrence. And I saw this, I said, okay, this is the tumor capsule, uh, this is the uh, ablation cavity, let's do ultrasound of that thing. And we did, and we were completely wrong. Because if you look at the arterial phase enhancement images, you can see a large area of arterial hyperenhancement. This is actually tumor, and ablation cavity is this almost imperceptible area of slightly heterogeneous liver. So there was a massive recur uh, residual re uh, HCC in this case. And you can see 20, 30 seconds after contrast injection, large portions of this tumor already demonstrating washout, confirming the diagnosis of incompletely ablated HCC in this patient. We also do contrast enhanced ultrasound of all patients uh, after chemoembolization. Um, chemoembolization you can do quickly. You can pretty much do it um, uh, hours or sometimes minutes after ablation. We do it approximately two weeks after ablation when patients come back to see the interventional radiologist for a follow-up visit. It just works better for everybody, including patients. Also, if you diagnose tumor recurrence or incomplete ablation in patients with taste, nobody will go back in a day or two because it takes up to two weeks for liver to recover from the first ablation for liver function tests to come down. So we give them a little bit of a break and then we scan them two weeks after to check for recurrent or residual disease. Before ablation, HCC with arterial phase hyperenhancement in the segment five of the liver, nicely matching uh, MRI, arterial phase imaging uh, in the same patient. After taste, lesion in the liver, 
contrast enhanced ultrasound with uh, bubbles going in. And you can see enhancement of the liver and nice completely black hole of the treated HCC with complete response. So we can tell patient just two weeks after ablation at their follow-up visit with their interventional oncologist, with interventional radiologist, that this is completely treated lesion. We do not need to worry about it. There is no need to follow this up. And they still do on occasion. And on MRI, you can see there is exactly the same thing. Look at the resolution, though. You can see every single bubble. You can see nicely defined uh, edges of the cavity. It's kind of darkish small tiny hole in the liver and MRI, so resolution of contrast enhanced ultrasound is absolutely unbelievable. This was done as a part of research project where we can do three-dimensional contrast enhanced ultrasound, slicing and dicing it, almost like CT, and you can see on multiple slices there is not a single bubble entering this small tiny cavity in patient who had complete response to his treatment. Another patient, liver, kind of poorly defined, treated HCC two weeks after taste. Yep. Nobody in the playing automatically. In, uh, on. Injecting microbubbles. And you can see initially the center of the cavity is all devoid of contrast, but then we start seeing chunks of tumor along the periphery, and then we start slice, sliding and uh, scanning along the tumor, and you can see there is almost five centimeter mass sitting right at the border of the previously treated HCC. This patient, thanks God, went for microwave ablation two weeks after we developed this, um, detected this anablated tumor, because this patient had large portions of the mass extending very close to portal vein. If you wait four to eight weeks like we normally do for CT and MRI to evaluate treatment response, you can turn this into a tumor in vain and then patient would not be transplant candidate. So doing it early actually saves lives and can improve care of your patients. Again, the three-dimensional um, reconstruction of this contrast enhanced ultrasound bolus, you can see large swaps of the residual perfusion of the tumor, HCC, sitting inside of the previously ablated cavity. Angiomyelolipomas in a kidney um, is extremely difficult lesion to follow after ablation on CT and MRI because it's very fatty and CT will not be able to pick up residual blood flow because there is not enough blood vessels in those lesions. And they're also very difficult to evaluate on MRI because they produce such a high T1 signal contrast agent enhancement will not decrease it enough uh, for you to pick up contrast enhancement. So this is a large patient with a large re, uh, AML. It measured, what, 11 centimeter. CT before the ablation, large AML. There is not a question in anybody's mind that this is AML. Went for ablation, and the lesion didn't shrink in size. They followed it for about three years. Patient had three post-ablation CT scans had two MRI scans, everybody saying the same thing. Same size, no enhancement, ablated AML, continue follow-up. Interventional radiologists don't want patients to sit with large tumors because AML is supposed to shrink after we ablate them, and this lesion did not, despite five imaging studies that were performed looking for residual perfusion. They went back and they did catheter angiogram, seeing exactly the same thing large void in a kidney with no supplying arteries, so everybody was crushing their heads because they could not figure out why this lesion is not shrinking. So it came to ultrasound. You can see this large heterogeneous mass in the kidney. And for this lesion, we did CT and contrast enhanced ultrasound fusion because I was not really sure where this lesion ends and uh, mesenteric and peritoneal fat begins. Those guys, especially after ablation, large ones, quite difficult to delineate, so I wanted to do CT fusion with contrast enhanced ultrasound so I know exactly what I'm looking at. Um, kidney sitting in here, this is overlay, display, and then this is the large AML. So when we look at this CT, we were kind of under impression that this is residual tumor and all this is probably treated AML, and boy, were we wrong. 
So when we gave this patient microbubbles, you can see this whole entire tumor that we thought is ablated, is enhancing like Christmas tree, and that denser area of ablated or residual tumor was actually the only zone that got ablated after this uh, initial ablation of this patient. So they went back and they found large feeder uh, supplying this giant tumor from the distal lumbar artery, and they don't usually do lumbar arteriograms when they ablate AMLs, they usually go through renal arteries. So we basically told them to go and do microwave ablation, they did, and this patient is doing fine on follow-up imaging. Another horrible thing that interventional radiology is being asked to do all the time is putting cholecystostomy tubes in patients in ICU with fever and no sign of infection. We all call it cholecystitis when we see gallbladders looking like this. Quite often when we stick a needle in those gallbladders, we send bile to culture and microbiology and we all get nothing. So for us, it would be very, very nice to find a way to diagnose acute cholecystitis on those patients. And I think conscious enhanced ultrasound is a fantastic way to do it. It's portable, you can do it in ICU, you don't need to bring the patient down to MRI and scan them. So you inject conscious, if you see nice, thin layer of enhancement in a gallbladder wall, this is cholecystitis, those patients do not need cholecystostomy tubes. Gangrenous cholecystitis on B mode ultrasound early on looks almost identical to this first case, but on contrast enhanced ultrasound, you can see raggedy, eaten up mucosa, you can see very abnormal hyper enhanced areas of the liver with surrounding hyperemia. Classic gangrenous cholecystitis, this will need cholecystostomy tube. You can also diagnose perforations on contrast enhanced ultrasound as outpouching and small tiny abscesses that extend from the gallbladder into the liver. Of course you can see it on CT, but you can see it much better on contrast enhanced ultrasound. Also you can do this at the bedside. You don't need to bring this vented patient on pressors and with 15 bags of antibiotics and other medications hanging all around it, which is a giant production for our OCU to CT scan and do it with additional contrast injections, you can do it on the floor at the bedside, providing very accurate diagnosis of gangrenous perforated cholecystitis. All right, by popular demand, I added a few slides on trauma. And I, can th I think that contrast enhanced ultrasound is very good for trauma in acute settings. Um, I don't think it will be very useful in multi-organ trauma because usually when we have high-speed vehicle uh, accidents and we need to check spine and liver and spleen and bowel and other things, lung contusions, we cannot obviously do it with contrast enhanced ultrasound. But for focal penetrating trauma or for focal liver ulcerations like this, sensitivity of contrast enhanced ultrasound is almost identical to CT. So if you have focal lesion that you need to evaluate in patients with penetrating liver injury, if they have contraindications to contrast, ultrasound might be a perfect way to do it. I think there is more applications for trauma in PEDS because they rarely have multi-organ trauma. It's usually more focal. Um, renal ulceration, same kidney with um, large area of extravasating contrast. You can see contrast corking out of this lacerated kidney, very similar to findings on CT. Renal spleen injury, very, very helpful days after injury, when you need to confirm that there is no active extravasation. You probably, if you have a patient like this, you're probably gonna do CT to start. If you see no active extravasation, we can watch these patients, but some of them continue to go down, pressure is dropping, hemoglobin is dropping, so there is always question a couple days after acute injury, is there a recurrent a bleed in the spleen, is there a splenic rupture? Those questions for sure, when I point it and towards one organ, you can definitely answer them with conscious enhanced ultrasound. Nice enhancing spleen, large area of decreased uh, perfusion, splenic infarct, whatever, there is no active extravasation, there is no reason to do CT, and there is no reason to embolize patients like this. All right, moving to endolix. This is one of the great applications of contrast enhanced ultrasound. We do quite a few of them, because our CT um, 
um, our vascular surgeons don't really want to CT all those patients with slowly enlarging um, uh, aneurysmal sacs. They want to do contrast first, and quite a few patients we rule out and the leaks because contrast enhanced ultrasound is so much sensitive than CT and MRI in detection of endoleaks. Quickly, five different types of endoleaks. The type uh, one and type three are antegrade. And when you see those, you're gonna see enhancement in the lumen of the graft and enhancement in the excluded aneurysm at the same time. And timing of enhancement in excluded aneurysm is critical because it will tell you and help you to differentiate antegrade type one and three and the leaks from the retrograde, which is type two, filling, pseudo aneur uh, filling aneurysmal sac from collateral vessels. Type four, grand porosity doesn't really happen with newer uh, stents. We really don't see it anymore. And this mysterious type five, when nobody can figure out where uh, the endoleak is coming from, when CT, SMRs, and angio, uh, angiograms are all negative, they label it as type five, and actually they're all wrong, because most of the type five endoleaks turn out to be very slow, delayed type two endoleaks that we can easily diagnose on contrast and here's ultrasound, but they're almost imperceptible on CT and MRI. First, because there is not a ton of blood entering excluded aneurysmal sac, producing very, very subtle changes in density, and also they could be quite delayed, taking maybe 20, 30 seconds after arterial phase to enhance. By the time those endoleaks fill with uh, contrast, patients are already out of the scanner on a stretcher trying to go back to their room. So timing of entry of the contrast into exclude is SAC is the most important to tell one and three from two, and then the location of the leak can tell you one, two, and three, providing more information for your interventional radiologist or vascular surgeons trying to fix it. Patients who undergo surveillance face cost, nephrotoxicity of um, agents that we use for CT and MRI and radiation exposure. For everybody, it's kind of slowly trying to step away from doing CT MRs for those patients and try to find something else. Color adapter is just not sensitive enough, so everybody is kind of under the same impression that contrast enhanced ultrasound can be the way to go. Couple examples, large aortic aneurysm with a stent in the middle in patients with slowly enlarging aneurysmal sac on CT. This was father of one of our physicians and she didn't really know what to do because they did CT and angiograms and everything was negative, but SAC was enlarging. Went to outside hospital and they saw this. There is some pretty convincing leak of the color doppler signal at the junction between different portions of the graft. So he was labeled as type three in the leak at outside institution and came to us for treatment. Contrast enhanced ultrasound, again, excluded aneurysmal SAC stand in the middle, we give contrast agent, and you can see nice filling of the graft with not a single microbubble entering the sac here at the junction between two components of the graft. So we excluded type three in the leak, we actually went back and we remeasured um, our aortic aneurysm uh, sac diameter on multiple CTs and there was no change in size, so we basically told them not to worry about it, and then went home. One thing about doing aortic endolix studies, you have to have the dose of contrast that you use. We usually use 1.5 ml, and it's more than enough, because you're gonna have such a massive amount of microbubbles in the aorta. If you give patient 2.4 ml, you're gonna have massive blooming artifact. You're gonna shadow the far field, you will not see much behind this aortic graft. So for those, I would start with very, very low dose of contrast. If we use Lumason, I would start with maybe 1 ml, 1.5. For Definity, I would probably use 0 0.1, maybe even less, because Definity produce quite a strong uh, reflection when you use it for aortas.
So no endolic on consciousness enhanced ultrasound patient went home. Another patient had similar story enlarging and the leak. There was some confusion with CTs and MRIs. Um, on ultrasound, we did see what we called type 2 and the leak. We saw IMA coming into the excluded portion of the graft with a color Doppler signal. And this was confirmed on pulse Doppler examination. So our impression was small type 2 and the leak. This patient went to embolization. They couldn't get to IMA. He came back to see us. We percutaneously stuck a needle in this uh, excluded portion of the graft, coiled it, and patient came back six months later with enlarging, uh, enlarging aneurysmal sac. CT was very limited because of the, all the coils that we put in, so they really didn't have anything else but to do contrast enhanced ultrasound. Stent, excluded graft, sagittal view of this patient. You see microbubbles going in, filling the graft, and almost immediately after microbubbles arrive into the graft, you see this massive endoleak with contrast just pouring out of the junction between two portions of the graft. And then on top of everything, there is IMA and there is slow filling of the uh, excluded aneurysm sac from IMA. So this patient went from small, tiny type 2 in the leak to massive type 3 in the leak and persistent type 2 in the leak. And those guys will have to be relined. There is absolutely nothing else they can do other than open repair. So we upgraded this patient with microbubbles significantly. We relined him. He is under surveillance doing just fine. There is actually a ton of literature on endoleaks. There are multiple meta-analyses, multi-center trials, whatnot. They, all of them show the same thing. The contrast enhanced ultrasound is more sensitive than CT and MRI in diagnosing of endoleaks. It's safer for the patient. And also there is now beginning, uh, I see some papers from, uh, from the uh, Europe predominantly saying that there are no type 5 endoleaks, all of them are misdiagnosed type 2 endoleaks in patients with late and uh, delayed entrance of the blood into the excluded sac. So use contrast enhanced ultrasound to characterize your endoleaks. It's a fantastic application. There is no difference in detection rate between type 1 and type 3 endoleaks in contrast enhanced ultrasound compared to CT. I think we're much more sensitive to type 2 in the leaks, and patients really like this modality much better without the risk of radiation and massive doses of identity contrast agents injection. So as a conclusion, I think contrast enhanced ultrasound is very versatile imaging modality in a very wide range of interventional applications. It provides similar diagnostic performance compared to other imaging modalities such as CT and MRI when it comes to end leaks and post-treatment, post-ablation evaluation. It has lower costs, and please use it and talk to your interventional radiologist about it. They'll thank you for that. All right, any questions? Well, I think I answered them all in my lecture, so. So I'll ask you one. So Andre, you showed such nice pictures of how sharp the taste sites were. Are you, are you targeting like fairly a, a discrete lesion or more a zone that's abnormal? Well, they all end up with residual tumors still being visible on females, so we just go there. Do that. Okay, that was very nice. So now 